No problem. But what an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> So I think the first question was already asked. Was it? <laughs> they didn't notice. <laughs> How good does it work for the EU to have a high representative? It works. I wouldn't change I, one... It sounded slightly different. <laughs> Just Ask any of the two if they become my successor in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it works. It works. Jokes apart. Um, I wouldn't change one single comma of the Lisbon Treaty when it comes to my job. I'll give you one example. Uh, I think one of the best uh, results we have achieved in this uh, last three, four years is the work on the European Union defense. Uh, our founding fathers and mothers had tried that for 50, 60, 70 years. It never worked. And we managed to do this. I believe we managed to do this also because in the Lisbon Treaty, you indicate that there's one person doing the high representative, the Vice President of the Commission and the Head of the European Defence Agency. And that is a lot of work. You don't sleep, you don't get a life anymore, but you can, if you want, and if you try to create the space and the conditions, you can try to come to a certain coherence between the different efforts, between the different policies. I've been a minister myself, so I would never put the question in terms of asking a minister to make space for someone else. But what you can do as a high representative is to use the added value that the European Union brings to any national foreign minister, because no foreign minister in this world of today of one single country has the leverage that it has, he or she has, through the 28. But so use the power. It, it's, it's not asking to step back and create space is asking actually to make one step forward and act European. Then it makes sense for everybody, and actually it's convenient for everybody. But do you feel sidelined every now and then by the other foreign affairs ministers? No. No. Uh, what, uh, what worries me is what Miro was saying at last, that now uh, there is a tendency to see as a point of pride uh, if you stop a decision. While before uh, there were decisions that were stopped, uh, but there was a sense of um, responsibility, uh, of belonging together. Uh, it is true that the wind has changed, not only on foreign policy, actually on foreign policy much less than in other issues. Look at immigration, internal policies, they suffer much more of this trend than the foreign policy or the defense policy. On the defense issues, we voted at unanimity at 28 with the UK in the last three years. Mm. Doesn't make the headlines. Uh, but what worries me is this, uh, is that uh, the, the winds now, not only in Europe, go in another direction. Uh, I played alone. This risk to endanger not just the role of the, you know, of the European Union foreign policy or the high representative, but the European Union itself. Uh, if you believe that uh, uh, it's smarter to go alone than together, first of all, you don't realize how big China is, I believe, but uh, apart from that, uh, you lose your, your asset, you lose your real tools, you lose your leverage, uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, you give up one of your instruments. But you mentioned the, the like, steps that were made in terms of military cooperation in yeah. Europe. Being a success compared to what it was achieved in the decades before. Yeah. But still, whatever it can High achieve in the end, it will women. be far short, <laughs> perhaps, of, of what it is needed on a military, uh, in a military uh, sphere to be really taken serious. Are we betting on the wrong horse trying to, inc to improve military cooperation instead of using economic power we really have, and we see how important it is, mm -hmm. especially with Iran. Are we betting on the wrong horse in improving our military, which also alienates the US administration even more in this situation? I think uh, in the US there's uh, quite some understanding, not uh, a consensual understanding, but nothing seems to be consensual in the United States, so that's norm, about the fact that more European Union cooperation 
uh, on defense issues is actually helping uh, in the burden trading exercise. Um, the but, last you, but you received a letter from the US saying if you go with your model of funding, then you can even face sanctions from the US. I that. was with the NATO defense ministers yesterday evening, and uh, we had a conversation exactly on that again, uh, and it was probably the 20th time we had that conversation. And I was telling them very clearly, and the member states that are also NATO allies, which are 22 if I'm not wrong, were saying the same. As we started to work on the European Union defense cooperation, Budgets, military budget, defense budgets of the EU member states have gone up, which didn't happen since years, even if all previous US administrations were advocating for more burden sharing. What we're doing is, in the European Union, not betting on military compared to civilian or economic power. Our strong power is a soft power. We know that well, we're going to continue to use it. And even the military power, even the defense part of our work, is always done in the European way. But giving up to the economy of scale of the European Union defense investments simply doesn't make sense of the world, in the world of today. If you put the defense budgets of the EU member states all together, it's the second largest in the world. And that's 90% in the NATO alliance. Do we want to give it up? So, the point is not to decide how, member state, how much member state can invest on defense. This is a national choice. This is sovereignty it's for national parliaments and governments to decide. But we have an economy of scale that currently on defense we're not using. So we simply said, instead of having a fragmentation, let's put things together. And let's see if we can incentivize member states to work together also in the field of defense. And the first concrete result of this has been a project on military mobility, that is a project that is useful for NATO, and that without the European Union, incentivizing the changes in the infrastructures, uh, looking at the uh, bureaucratic norms for transportation and things like that, that would not happen. So, a concrete project of cooperation on defense of the European Union that is beneficial to NATO, with European Union money, by the way, I think it makes perfectly sense. But this is not an alternative to investing more on European global role in other fields. You mentioned the economy, and I think that one of the key uh, challenges for the years to come will be to use our economic um, tools, our economic sovereignty, starting from the euro, in the global landscape a bit more than we've done so far. This would not be in the competences of the high representative, not now nor later. Should it be? But it, no, we just not necessarily. No, because we have established in these five years um, a good practice, uh, something I would uh, strongly suggest is continued for, for the next five years. Uh, we have established this group of commissioners uh, that is uh, uh, regularly, every month, is gathered under my coordination. Um, one hour meeting, uh, all commissioners that have uh, a portfolio that relates to the topics on the agenda come, so not only the external ones, but we can have climate, we can have culture, we can have science and technology, you can have agriculture, you can have whatever. And depending on the agenda, being it China, being it uh, the agreement with Mercosur, being it uh, the Sahel, you name it, we give a certain coherence to the work of the Commission in relation to the work of the Council of Foreign Affairs. And that, I think, works finally, starts to work finally well. And this could include, for instance, uh, increasing the work that the Commission and the economic commissioners, the economic vice presidents, do in the use, for instance, of the currency for global purposes. It sounds to me to make Europe more efficient, yeah. but not making it a global superpower. So even if we go to the end of all those developments, I, do, you, do you think it, it will really change the, the position of, of the EU? Yeah, I think it would. I think it has changed already. Uh, when I started, I remember very well that the question I was asked the most was how to make Europe relevant. How do you bring the European Union in, at the table as a relevant player? Uh, and again, the Polish minister made, uh, Jacek made a, a relevant point. Uh, when I started, I was uh, quite frustrated coming in and finding a, a format that didn't include the European Union at the table. At the end of the day, I have to say it worked quite well in terms of coordination, because uh, the two member states that are sitting at that table uh, have always shared information and we've always coordinated even during the meetings of the Normandy format. Uh, and it can 
even help us play in different roles, uh, inside and outside. But apart from that, the point at that time, 2014, 2015, was how to make the European Union relevant as a player. Today, you go from Japan to, to Chile, uh, to New Zealand, uh, to the Arctic, or to Canada, you don't, you're not asked if the European Union is relevant. You're asked whether the European Union is focused enough on its global responsibilities, and it's not starting to be inward looking. So the global player role is recognized by our partners. I'm not 100% sure it's recognized by Europeans, and I think this might be part of the problem. But let's have a look into that in, on a very concrete situation. We are having a situation where I think from a European perspective, the Americans are playing with war in Iran. So we saw what happened after the invasion of Iraq, with up until the refugee crisis with all the consequent uh, developments. We are having NATO uh, training mission in Iraq, we have NATO force in Afghanistan. So we also have a European Union uh, mission in Iraq. You we, knew it. We, we have we have Turkey as a with a share sharing a border with Iran, mm -hmm. and still no real coordination, no common approach to Iran. Can you talk? Can we talk about the transatlantic alliance there? If something that's so fundamental for Europe. We have uh, well, it's so fundamental for the rest of the world as well. Uh, I think there's no, uh, almost no single country or no single uh, continent in the world for which it is not uh, relevant what happens around Iran, uh, also because of the geography. Iran is always considered uh, as a Middle Eastern player, uh, but it's a player in Afghanistan, a co potentially a player in Afghanistan, Central Asia, uh, Asia, uh, the oceans. But we have no say in that. We have no say. No. Oh, ask Washington. <laughs> we only talk about that almost. No, that's not true. Uh, we talk about everything. But uh, uh, the European Union, first of all, has a policy on Iran and has kept, has built and has kept a policy on Iran in unity, in full unity, till now. And I con I, I'm convinced it will continue. And we have some level of disagreements on some issues with Washington, uh, the approach to the nuclear deal. Uh, has become an issue of disagreement with Washington after Washington decided, after this US administration decided to uh, stop uh, um, uh, implementing the, uh, the agreement. Um, that I want to remind us all uh, is uh, a UN Security Council resolution. It's not an agreement, actually. Um, but we have kept uh, our line together with the rest of the international community, apart from a couple of countries. We have done probably the most difficult and also the most decisive uh, steps to try and keep the deal alive. And as of today, more than one year after the US left the implementation of the agreement, Iran today is still compliant with the agreement. You asked me one year ago if I believed it was possible. I would have told you, well, publicly I would have told you for sure, but I think it's quite a miracle <laughs> that, uh, that this has happened. And this has happened because of the European Union, not only of the European Union, this has happened also because I believe uh, the rest of the international community has uh, helped us all to keep uh, in place a multilateral agreement that has proven to be uh, successful so far. It's not perfect, nothing in life is perfect, and doesn't cover essential elements that we would like to cover, but it was never meant to cover non-nuclear issues. So, on the policy on Iran, there are issues on which, with the United States, we are, um, we are discussing on everything. On some issues, we disagree. For instance, we believe that keeping the GCPOA in place is the basis for building on further discussions and further possible agreements. What worries us the most is the perspective of an escalation. I think that everybody in Europe, but also everybody in the region, and for sure in our neighboring continents, those that are close enough to be worried for a, the perspective of military escalation, uh, are telling our American friends the same, and obviously are telling Tehran first and foremost the same. A military escalation, a military option in that area would be a disaster, not only for the region, but for the world. Do you think and I'm sure that in Washington, many think the same. Do you think we're going to get back to the good old times with a better transatlantic relationship? Or do you think, as German Chancellor Angela Merkel said, 
the times where we could really rely on each other are more or less over? For me, this is a difficult question because I don't know if this comes in the job description of the German Marshall Fund fellow, <laughs> but I'm so much and deeply... I, I always experience a lively <laughs> debate. So. No, I, I'm so much in love with the country. And for sure, a lot of that depends on the month I spent in strange places in the United States. Uh, that gave me an insight of what America is. I'm so much in love with the country that I cannot imagine of good times and bad times because there are and there can be political disagreements. But we have political disagreements inside the European Union as well. You might have political disagreements inside a coalition government in one country oh. or inside one party. That's, <laughs> uh, that's democracy, that's life, that's okay. And, and we have had difficult moments in the past. You mentioned the Iraq war. Those were difficult times for the transatlantic relations. And that was a split inside the European Union as well. So I wouldn't define the good old times and the challenging or difficult times now and what comes next. I think we entered into, hopefully, what can be defined a mature friendship, partnership, uh, where we can, uh, we can accept that we have political disagreements on some issues, and that this doesn't put into question the fact that we're friends, partners, that we are on the same side of history and of the world. And if you look at the list of things on which we work closely together, the number of issues on which cooperation continues to be perfectly working and vital are many more than the ones that are not working. We have two or three issues where we clearly disagree. The Iran nuclear deal, the status of Jerusalem, uh, multilateralism and climate change, and trade, five. <laughs> so what? And, 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 and Huawei is still to come. Uh, Huawei is not and for me. And trade is Huawei, also still to Huawei come. Huawei is, is for member states, at least some. <laughs> at least some. Um, but, but no, but mentioning seriously, China is clearly one of the issues on which uh, it would be only natural for us to work together, because we have the same concerns. But, anyway, but, but what, apart from what that, does it mean to but work together from, but, on that? But apart from that, if I can mention you 10, 20, 30 issues on which our daily work continues, and even sometimes it's even better than before, on the Balkans, on Afghanistan, on the PRK, uh, on uh, some regions in Africa, on Ukraine, uh, on Syria, we continue to work very closely together. So. I'm not saying that the points of disagreement are irrelevant. In some cases, for us Europeans, is the DNA. Support to multilateralism, support to the UN system, for us is the DNA. Is how you conceive the world. We go multilateral, we go cooperative. The zero-sum game doesn't belong to our thinking. So we try to build uh, those boring exercises where everybody finds its own benefit in finding an agreement, because we, we are born out of that kind of experience. Germany and France started to come together when they defined that uh, it was more convenient to be on the same side and make business rather than make war. That's very pragmatic. This, this is why Europe was started as a project. We are a multilateral experiment and we're probably the most successful one in history. So that is clearly in our DNA. But you take Iran on the nuclear deal or on the opportunity of having or possibility of having a military escalation, we're definitely on another page. But when it comes to Syria, with the United States, we're perfectly on the same side. And we have the same concerns on the role of Tehran in Damascus. So it's, it's not black and white. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. The world is complicated. Life is complicated. The good point is that in this, I believe there's an opportunity for the Europeans, and maybe also for the Americans, to understand that there is a certain level of responsibility on our side, that we can exercise a role, and, and we cannot always rely on others to do things. Uh, maybe we're growing up in this difficult exercise. Since we're getting closer to the end of our time, and you're getting closer to the end of your mandate, yes. if you look <laughs> forward and you could make a wish, what would be the instruments your successor should have in this sense you, you didn't have? Uh, I'm not sure it's an instrument. Instruments are there. Instruments are there. But if I could make a wish uh, for, for the next mandate, for things to really work better is consistency of member states. 
not unanimity. We never had a problem in adopting a decision unanimously in the Council. In five years, I never had a problem of that kind. We never did wording of conclusions. We never had uh, that kind of experience. But what we would really need is ownership, is the sense of uh, a decision taking at European level as it is decided by the member states. It's a 28 deciding around the table, it's not someone else. Five minutes after that, one day after that, one week after that, that is my own position, that is my own policy, and I work for implementing that. Ownership and consistency. That is what would really, I think, make the, the extra difference. What was the worst example of not taking that ownership? In which situation? No, I don't. I, I tend to focus on the positive. Uh, you're not. You're not. <laughs> but I can tell you. I can tell you. Not to the end of your mandate. <laughs> 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 it's true that this, this last four months uh, are quite intense, <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not yet in the mood of, uh, of uh, you know, the legacy, the, the 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 lessons learned, because there's so much still ongoing that uh, you know you, you try to keep track and uh, and keep working on every single file uh, till the every single day. Uh, differently from the other commissioners, for me, you know, the world doesn't stop. So for me, until midnight of the 1st of November, uh, you're not uh, half in the job, you're in the job. So you, you just... Uh, uh, the 1st of November, I'll, I'll reflect on the negative examples, but I have a couple of positive examples. Defence is one of those. I'm, I'm and, sure about that. No, 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 but <laughs> one, 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 that one that I want to say, because it's normally very controversial, and that's the external part of our work on migration. On migration, our member states have been as divided as they could be. But, and they still are probably, <laughs> but on the external work we have done with Africa in particular, but also with uh, Afghanistan, with Pakistan, with Iran, by the way. Iran hosts three million Afghans, by the way. But the work we've done with Africa in particular makes me proud, because that is something that was not existing when I arrived. I remember very well, as an Italian, it was a shock to see there was no external migration policy, it was only about borders. And we've started with the full ownership of member states to develop partnerships with our African Union partners, with the countries of origin, of transit, and still a long way to go, but now there is something in place that starts to work. Partnership, European Union, African Union, UN, we've done something good there. Thank you very much, Thank Federica you. Mogherini. Thank you. Thanks for this great debate. Thank you. And, and I'm uh, sorry. all the best for the remaining months. Thank you. And for, and for getting back my life afterwards, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, everybody here in the room. Thank you. Enjoy the coffee break and uh, see you at the next session. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.